Mythos Busters, investigating the mystery, monsters, and madness of Arkham Horror, the card game. Hello, and welcome to episode 168 of Mythos Busters. As you may have surmised, I am your host, I am Sean. Joining me are your other hosts. It's a full crew tonight. We've got Ian. Hey, Ian. Hello. How's your Friday? It's good. It's uh, that most wonderful time of the year, as we were talking about before the show. Oh, it sure is. Are you ready to curl up with a nice cup of cocoa and a campaign guide? Yep. Yep. Uh, Joining us as well is Scott. Hey, Scott. Hello. What's your favorite cold day beverage? Honestly, I think an iced coffee of some sort. That. Same. Counterintuitive, you two. I know. I know. I... You know me. I love cold weather, and I love being. I'm, I'm just always running too hot. So mm. like, some kind of like fruit. Fru- oh, an iced pumpkin spice latte. Mmm. <laughs> iced though. That's what gets me. Like, sure, pumpkin spice is like great comfort fall food. But here's the thing: if oh, you man. if you live in northern Canada, like, do you just not eat ice cream for nine months of the year? I mean, I live in southern Canada, so it can't be like crazy different. <laughs> take by your silence (laughs) well yeah i don't know i i yeah i'm a basic bitch i love the pumpkin spice and i loved ice drinks so Mm -hmm. yeah all great all great and that was justin of course hey justin hey yeah scott you lost me when you you called pumpkin spice coffee like just (laughs) there's extra stuff in there yeah we got we got all manner of purists up in here yeah i mean you do you i'm just i'm not gonna drink it well Mm -hmm. there's espresso plus flavoring so Listen, I'm I'm not going to let anyone hate on pumpkin spice because it's delicious. Mm. Who doesn't mm. like like a pumpkin pie smoothie, right? I, right? I mean, I think the reason that it's got the basic bitch moniker that it does now is because it is just it's like vanilla, right? Like vanilla is good, but like mm-hmm. it's so basically good that it just it gets labeled as basic. Vanilla is one of the most complex flavors we have as humans. Like it's very good. I'm a yeah. vanilla fan. It's fantastic. Next time on Taste Busters, we take on <laughs> Taste <chocolate>. Budsters. <laughs> Tongue Busters. Okay, well, well, believe it or not. That's a different one. Well, I, I hope you too, dear listeners, are curling up with your favorite cold weather drink because tonight mm-hmm. we are breaking down the Edge of the Earth campaign in anticipation of Iron Man 2024, uh, which will be happening at BusterCon 2024 this year. Uh, so, Justin. For anyone who has gotten this far in our podcast biosphere without knowing, tell them what was going on with BusterCon. I mean, if they did, kudos to them for however they're living their life. You're, and you're welcome. A, yeah. Uh, BusterCon, we are throwing the uh, second ever BusterCon in Roseville, Minnesota at the Game Center uh, from September 19th through 22nd. So that's a Thursday through a Sunday. Uh, we're recording this in August, so it's it's less than a month until BusterCon, boys. Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to be great. We've got four days of Arkham. The the fourth one is optional. We are also doing our Dead CCG day slash play whatever you want day. Uh, Saturday is Iron Man. We play through all of Edge of the Earth. And on the other days, we've got a lot of uh, opportunities to do the massive multiplayer versions of the different scenarios. You can just play pickup games with people. There's going to be... Uh, a bunch of standalone scenarios, a chance to potentially talk to the des- Arkham designers, some of the fan designers, and just meet a whole bunch of other uh, really chill, really cool Arkham fans. So we've got that coming up very soon. And then I'm just going to keep going with my next item on our uh, our show notes so we can get right into Do the it. good stuff soon. Mm-hmm. Do it. Uh, yeah. Uh, so before we dive into talking about Iron Man... Quick shout out to all of our patrons. We're not doing the the rundown for board or others this time because if you have not yet heard uh, from our bonus episode that Sean and I recorded quickly or seen the email that I've sent out through Patreon, we've got some changes coming up there where we're switching over to a monthly model instead of per creation. Rather than take up more time here, please go check out that email or check out that update. For the most part, you don't need to do anything unless you are at one of our two highest tiers. And even then it's one of them needs to switch something when it's an FYI. So overall, not much should change, even though you'll see some things change on Patreon, Patreon's end. And with that, let's talk about Iron Man. 
Let's. So, uh, I guess one other little bit of content synergy. Last week, uh, Scott, Justin, and I sat down with Ian's spreadsheet and special guest Phileon, friend of the show and special guest Phileon, and we kind of did a little bit of the the background digging on the campaign. We kind of rifled through some cards. We talked about varying strategies, you know, through through the course of the campaign, and that's going to inform a lot of what we're talking about here tonight. So go check that out on our Twitch and YouTube as well. But now we have the man, the plan himself here, Ian, uh, and his magical multicolored spreadsheet uh, <laughs> to guide us through this campaign. So, Ian, why don't you take us away? Yeah, so a couple of caveats, because I do love me a good caveat. Um, this is my attempt at diving into Edge of the Earth and coming up with what I b- believe is the best plan, but uh, uh, I'm not held responsible if it leads anyone out there to death. Um, <laughs> it's the best plan few... we have going in, so... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, there are a few elements in here that I've left open because I wanted us to discuss... Um, as a group live on the episode, um, what we want to do, and that particularly revolves around scenarios that we could potentially skip. So we'll get into that, um, Mm -hmm. and kind of think about what's the best path forward. But to start off, and uh, sorry, yeah, Ian, uh-huh. what real quick, just because I always only remember like ten minutes into the discussion. Mm-hmm. Let's cap it off at the beginning this time. Major spoiler alert oh, for yes. Edge of the Earth. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we are ripping the guts out of this thing tonight. <laughs> uh, so if it's something that you haven't played yet and would prefer not to have spoiled for you, uh, check back with us at another time. But otherwise, let's dig in. Yeah, this is like as spoilered as anything could be. <laughs> when we do these episodes because uh i actually enjoy this process and i know you do too scott of like painstakingly Mm -hmm. going through a campaign guide and every encounter deck and just like tearing it to pieces to see how it Mm -hmm. works um i think we had uh, maxine on a previous episode mm. and i i think it was after our circle undone maybe I, i i forget uh but she brought up a really good uh, view on this is that this is essentially a speed run and if you think of like speed run video gamers who find every little glitch every little nook and cranny you can like put your character in and then you jump double high whatever something like that like this is the equivalent but in arkham version so if that's not what you want to hear well mm-hmm. go away for now <laughs> no, not in a bad back. way I, I'm, just, yeah. I'm just saying like like come back after you've you've played this just, campaign a few times and had fun and all those things yeah. but this is absolutely like something that you want to come to when when you want to speed run this campaign when you want to take this campaign bend it over your back and or bend it over your knee and break its back kind of thing so I was going to give it loving taps on the bum, but I guess everyone, everyone, nope. <laughs> do you? You too can be Bane, <laughs> Stone Cold Stunner. Just boom. Yeah. Man, they're aggressive in Northern Canada. <laughs> <laughs> and if anyone's curious, uh, Scott, what you were referring to is you and I tried to do a speed run of uh, Dream Eaters mm. with Jack and Ursula. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we did a speed run. We ended up getting really unlucky uh, at the last little bit, but uh, mm-hmm. at the end of that campaign, MJ hopped on with us and kind of expanded on one. speed running in the yes. Arkham context. Yeah, so that's out on our YouTube. Go check that out. It was a fun discussion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we're gonna dive into these nitty gritty details, but I think we usually like to start off kind of with a general sense of the campaign. I've had my head deep in this campaign, coming up with this plan. I'm not sure how fresh in the mind it is for you all, but when you just think about Edge of the Earth in general, what kind of comes to mind in terms of like what kind of campaign it is, what kind of things you have to think about when you're embarking on a new campaign? Yeah, so we were talking about it at the beginning of the show. This is actually, from a campaign structure perspective, not that complicated a campaign. Mm -hmm. Um, So as opposed to... The next time we do this for Dream Eaters, dear God, send help now. Uh, not Dream Eaters. This cam- um, Scarlet, Scarlet Keys. Keys. Yeah. Oh yes, yeah. Scarlet Keys, not Dream yeah. Eaters. <laughs> Dream Eaters Dream- is even more simple. Dream Eaters was also <laughs> complex. That was that's fair. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Anyway, so so you 
have a couple of you have many choices to make on the number and and manner of scenarios to play but it's still just a straightforward path like you're either just diverting and then eventually converging with the main path or you're not so i don't know the the choices are interesting uh kind of in the past we've always geared off of what ending we're going for right Mm. is that worth is that Mm -hmm. worth kind of saying up top yeah for sure like even going back to carcosa um not not so much with Dunwich, <laughs> but at least with Carcosa yeah. <laughs> going forward, like it always felt like most campaigns, I think it's fair to say, at least have like two major paths or two major endings. Of course there's the famous doubt and conviction because <laughs> and Scott's <laughs> laughing because we are at our own famous <laughs> moment of last minute doubt. Of <laughs> like which one AM yeah. yeah. the night before. <laughs> Um, yeah. Yes, the hour of doubt. One AM. <laughs> Not even the night before. It was the same day because we were starting the that, campaign. Th- this in like is nine true. Hours. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as, as late as he could possibly be. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's it's really common, and and yeah. So usually we kind of reverse engineer, be like, we want this ending. Let's work our way backwards. But yeah, I definitely agree, Sean. That this is there's not even that kind of major decision on the end and there's also not as many like decisions along the way compared to a lot of campaigns and before i started doing the working my way through coming up with this plan and tearing apart this edge of the earth like in my mind it was more complicated um and the way i remembered it as a more complicated campaign than it actually is i think because it was the first of the new release model it's worth mentioning Mm -hmm. um we're kind of in our iron man timeline we've we've started now with the first of these kind of new release model expansions Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's kind of the interesting part, right? Because Dream Eater's accepted because that has it had its own structure sure. in the past. We always had the same progression. It was just a matter of what resolutions mm. and choices you made along the way. Whereas here, you actually get to mix up the progression a little bit if you want. Albeit, it is still in a very straight line. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, it's a straight line, but there are side quests if you don't follow your straight line. Mm-hmm. Like I mentioned, like in my mind, it was because of that. It's like... It felt like it was going to be, when I embarked, I was like, okay, this is going to be a tough one. It's going to be really complicated. And then I was continually um, surprised by not only, like, there's not a lot of kind of branching paths, but also, and we'll get into this in scenarios, like, a lot of the consequences actually don't really have an impact later or the impact they have is minimal (laughs) um like some of the resolutions along the way so it's kind of interesting i i think probably because it was the first in the release model like it's kind of the first baby steps and it's not going to go too wild um and then the uh expansion after that of course (laughs) with full open world on us Uh, but we're not there yet this is still fairly linear I feel like Maxine with the, with this new release model, it was her and Jeremy at this point, I believe. Mm. Like they expanded on the idea of scenarios in this mm-hmm. with this new release model. In the next campaign, they expanded on the idea of what does a campaign look like? You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. it was like, what can we do with scenarios in this one? What can we do with the campaign in that one? Mm-hmm. Was how it felt. So gearing off the idea that we want to shoot for a specific ending Mm -hmm. i think a good place to start as it pertains to edge of the earth is that the the, one of the quote-unquote good endings is it requires one specific npc partner to make it through Mm. to the end Mm -hmm. yes and therein lies the the conundrum of plot armor (laughs) (laughs) so I can chat about this because I think I've been the uh, biggest proponent of this. The idea behind uh, plot armor, if you'd like to use it in this campaign, and I think we are going to because I think we're going to go for the, I don't want to call it the Kensler ending, but the Kensler ending. I mean, the Kensler ending makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So there's three points in the campaign where you can have a partner of the nine die randomly. And there's nothing you can do about it besides shuffle One wrong. Thing. <laughs> yeah. So we've proposed this this idea, and this kind of came from 
a couple ideas we've had in the past about altering the rules to a campaign because the whole idea of Iron Man is to you know come to the game center uh, enjoy your day play a whole campaign get the result you want if you've done everything right um, and the fact that randomness can affect that uh, chaos bag aside we've now instituted something like the the drawing of the weaknesses where you can draw your weakness and then you can choose to redraw it because we don't want a random draw just to like to just ruin your day because that isn't fun um, and so the idea behind uh, plot armor is that from those three instances which is the plane crash uh, something on the forbidden so it's, peaks it's the- it's the plane crash, the terror of the stars snatching you off of the peak, mm-hmm. yeah. and then the doorway in, in the City of the Elder, Elder Things. Yeah. So those three things, you can choose one partner from the beginning of the game before you do the plane crash, like from the very beginning. That partner is immune to those three deaths. Every other possible thing that can happen to that partner can still happen. So you take them out on a scenario and they die, well, that's your fault. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's those specific three things. So you can choose, and I mean, we'll be choosing Kensler. <laughs> to, I mean, I assume, but I okay, okay, not to get too far into the weeds before we actually mm-hmm. get to the conversation. Sure. Yeah, but yeah, in yeah. the prep, in the prep stream, there were good arguments made for Claypool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, there. Oh, Claypool's it, there. Yeah, it's very compelling. Yeah, yeah I was gonna. There was yeah, one. Well, I forget one other person too. Claypool was the main one, but then there was one other somebody who was going to save for some reason. And yeah, it's just I I thought it was a slam dunk. You you do Kensler, but it is not a unanimous decision across the board. Mm-hmm. K- Kensler gets you the I don't want to say the true ending, but right. The, the hardest to achieve ending, yeah. which is often the one that, like, you know, gamers, as we are, want to call, like, the true mm. ending. The one I had to work hardest for, right? Yeah. Claypool keeping the, bla- the bag clean is yes chef's kiss level of, yeah. Yeah, and that's the real argument, is if you got Claypool around, not only does he help you as a partner with Frost Tokens, but in the interludes, if you go speak with Claypool, he can remove Frost Tokens yeah. and, and keep you... Yeah, keep you clean. <laughs> I would almost call the Kensler ending like an alternate ending because, like, not necessarily the best. Because it's harder to achieve in the sense, like, can you randomly avoid drawing her three times? But like, all you're actually doing is just visiting her <laughs> uh, three times right, in right. the interludes. Like, it's not like you're actually doing something hard gameplay wise. So. Uh, yeah, it's, it's literally just keeping her alive. But yeah, we'll we'll get into all the partners because we have a, a whole tab on yield spreadsheet for for <laughs> the, the partners. But yeah, the the plot armor idea I think makes sense because one of the, like we talked about, how there's not a lot of choices. Um, a lot of the variability in this campaign is not a choice you make; it just depends on who survives. And so, mm-hmm. whereas in a lot of campaign, it would be like, choose this or choose that. And this, it's who's alive, who's dead. And mm-hmm. so, you're not actually making any decisions. It's just checking that off. And I think it works fine as a campaign when you're not doing Iron Man because it it feels like a very, one of the most, like, horror movie campaigns to me where, like, you have this crew and they're getting killed <laughs> off one by one and there's not much you can mm-hmm. do about it when it happens. But okay. then when we do this weird thing with the game, which is Iron Man, that kind of randomness, like you mentioned, Scott, doesn't really work as well. So mm-hmm. I think plot armor makes sense. <laughs> Vinny B brings up a thing. Only the plane crashes one is actually uncontrollable. Uh, if yeah. you strategically, sorry, strategically murder three pre-mountain, you get a chance to resolutify folks. Yeah, so this is something yeah. I was going to mention. So if if like full plot armor for the entirety of the campaign feels a little, I'm gonna use the word dirty. It's not the word I want to use, but that's the one I have right now. If it feels a little dirty to you to to give someone full plot armor, you can just give them plot armor for the plane crash because yeah. that is the only pure RNG one. Just mm-hmm. yeah, However, you have to step a little bit farther out of your way to make it to... Uh, oh, shoot. What's the hidden scenario called? Fatal Mirage. Uh, yep. Fatal Mirage 
early. Mm -hmm. And that is how you go through, if you finish the branch for a specific partner, then they become resolute and they become immune to the the later RNG effects. So kind of depends. Yeah. Um, It'd be interesting that the, we're going to get to it later, but uh, the configuration of your map Mm -hmm. in city city of the elder things is based on votes taken by the Mm -hmm. team which it just means again like he had said who's alive Mm -hmm. so i'm almost curious if there is a strategy to strategically murder three people go resolute (laughs) kensler and then you've fixed your vote to get the map you want (laughs) on and I'm just thinking of this now. Surely someone will figure it out. <laughs> yeah. It seems like a lot a... of work for little outcome, personally. <laughs> but, 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 yeah, yes. yes. So, so yes. if the full plot armor kind of makes you squick out, then you can just do plot armor on the first pull, and then the rest of it you can technically achieve through game gameplay mm-hmm. mechanics. I'd even be willing to say, like, if you're only going to do plot armor for the plane crash, there is a middle ground where you could choose the person who falls out of a plane. <laughs> mm, interesting. So, just fucking push someone. Yeah, just yeah. kick them out. <laughs> we're going down, and I'm not sure if I'm not sure if we're going to make it. But if we kill one, maybe it'll be fine. Yeah, we're going down. We need to lose 150 pounds. <laughs> just like push someone out. <laughs> Bye, Elia. On you needs oh, your shit. Oh no. <laughs> I no. mean, anyone who doesn't choose Elia is wrong. So. Oh. Anyways, <laughs> all that talk on plot armor, um, I think the one we're planning on using is the choose one person at the very beginning. They are immune to those three selection processes. Other than that, the game runs as normal. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, I- I'm sure we'll do the draw and see if the plot armor even mattered or not. We'll see. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I guess let's let's jump into it. I guess the other notable feature of the campaign we talked about partners. We'll talking about we'll be talking about frost tokens a lot. <laughs> um, that was the other kind of notable element of this campaign. New type of token. Um, mm-hmm. And if you don't remember what it does, if it's been a long time, it's minus one, and then you have to draw again. And if you get two frost, it's auto fail. And yeah, of course, Tekalili. <laughs> Did you want to say a little bit about that, Sean? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Tekalili is another distinctive feature of the of the campaign. It puts a little bit of extra pressure on resources, health, sanity, and keeping uh, uh, assets in play. But I think the real enemy of... Well, I think the real thing that Tekalili does is it, it hurts everyone's card draw mm. overall. So, um, yeah. I... Th- yeah, uh, see, here's the thing: is we, we've talked about this a lot up to now. We're going to talk about it a lot more tonight. I still have never played this campaign four player, three players as far mm. as I've topped out. Yeah. And Tekka Lili in particular, I think, is one of those mechanics that the encounter deck does better when it gets more encounter cards out and can t- can potentially combo the players on it. So I feel like mm. as kind of middling in difficulty and punishment as I feel Tekka Lili is. In my past run-throughs, I feel like in four players when it's going to be the hardest because we're just going to see so many more of the cards. That's a that's a good point. And like usually in one or two player, I'm never like drawing through the Tekalili deck. Uh, yeah, but I could see that happening in four player, and there's quite a few like enemies and effects that are like if you can't draw one, then this bad thing happens to you. So you might actually mm-hmm. suffer some of those effects. So speaking of bad things that can happen to you. Mm-hmm. Um, I, th- I think before we dive back into substance, this might be a real quick uh, point where we can shout out that uh, if you are at BusterCon, um, Reaverman slash the head librarian from the Restricted Collection will be uh, offering people additional optional ultimatums to make the campaign <laughs> do even more bad things to you if that is your jam. <laughs> um, there's more info about that on the uh, BusterCon website so go check that out uh if you want to learn more they're they're kind of neat we we will not be playing with them the campaign is punishing enough for us but uh if if you want an additional challenge potential reward something to check out our ultimatum is ultimatum of also running a convention mm-hmm. yeah, yeah mm-hmm. That's a right line. yes <laughs> right which oh. which proved to be too much for us last yeah, time. Really so. yes <laughs> yeah yeah oh i uh, just got a message from um, head librarian he uh he says or remote so if you're interested ping him and can learn more 
So, mm-hmm. And now back to your regularly scheduled <laughs> Iron Man plan. So let's jump into the prologue and, and get this train rolling. Um, or this airplane, I guess. This airplane are crashing. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's right. So prologue is a pretty simple choice. It is one of the, the few actual choices we get to believe Dyer or not. Um, and it's a pretty simple re- result of whether we get a cultist added to the bag or a tablet. And uh, a lot of cases when we've had these kind of choices in past campaigns... Uh, we kind of crunch the numbers, compare the bad stuff tokens, and there's usually a clear winner. Um, we're going to look at it right now, and I, I kinda, this is one where I want to talk through with you guys, because I'm actually not sure which of these is worse. I have a hunch, but I'm curious to hear what you all think. So just focusing on the cultist and tablet in the scenario so that we're not um, going through all of this. But so ice and death. So we're talking about th- these ta- these uh, tokens we're gonna have to deal with in potentially like two to three scenarios, depending on what we skip. The cultist is a minus two. If you fail, you shuffle the top card of the Tekalili deck into your deck. Um, and the tablet is minus three. For each point you fail by, discard the top card of your deck, and then you draw each weakness. So cultist gives you a Tekalili. Tablet potentially is like milling for Tekalilis. I think it's it's hard to look at these as an individual thing, especially because mm-hmm. it's for the whole campaign. Mm-hmm. Because I just look down the graph that we have. Mm-hmm. The cultist uh, is a variation of minus twos and minus ones. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you look at the tablet, and it mm-hmm. is all minus threes. Mm-hmm. And it's bad. So I feel mm-hmm. like while it sucks to put a Tekalili into your deck... Uh, it's only minus two. It's not a minus three. And minus three gets you drawing through your deck to find your weaknesses. Mm-hmm. And the the kind of rule with Arkham, as far as Sean has determined, is plus two is pretty good. So if you're at minus two, mm-hmm. you're probably okay. I think maybe for this campaign, it might be minus three based on your frost in the bag. But... Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I also want to point out that my plus two philosophy was based on like Carcosa era <laughs> meta. Yes, I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's incredibly wrong. I'm like, wrong, I'm like a plus three boy now. Plus, mm. I mean, plus three is like golden. I think yes. plus two. It's mostly on standard playing yeah. the odds. I think you might yeah. be okay. Yeah, yeah, I. It's a good place to be, obviously. Mm-hmm. One of the things I was looking at, too, because it kind of it goes back and forth for me, like not just looking at the modifiers, but the effects of these. Um, but for me, like if I have to break the tie, which is kind of what I needed to do, I look at the last couple of scenarios in a campaign because those are usually the ones that matter the most, obviously, especially the last scenario. And I feel like the cultist effects are a little bit better than the tablet. Like if you look at Heart of Madness the last uh, scenario, Mm -hmm. the cultist, if there's a seal at your location or if your location is a mist pylon, you treat the token as a frost token instead. Okay. That sucks. Like we don't want more frost, but then if you look at the tablet, it's minus three. And if you fail, you draw the top card of the tech Like you just straight up draw and it apply it. Like that's not great in the last scenario of the campaign. It feels like, um, and then but, City of the Elder Things, Cultist, if you fail, place a key you control on your location. Again, not great. It's just a little bit of a tempo hit, though. Tablet, if a Frost token was revealed during this test, you automatically fail. Um, yeah. I don't like auto fails, so. <laughs> I think the effects of the tablet are just really bad in this yeah. campaign. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. sure, like Heart of Madness, uh, if there's a seal at your location, or if you're at a Mist Pylon treat as a frost okay so it's a minus one draw again Mm -hmm. and if you've kept your bag clean there's a very low chance of you drawing another frost so it's just a minus one Mm -hmm. but minus three like that that's a that's a fail like that's a very reasonable fail yeah what's interesting is like normally when we have these kinds of discussions there's a little bit more like give and take but i think i can pretty say categorically the cultist is a better thing to have in the bag yeah is that fair yeah i mean maybe forbidden peaks yeah, that was one of the main ones I was looking at. But it's a minus mm. one. Um, yeah, like be one up. So you, it should be passable. Just be one up. <laughs> Just or, pass yeah. tests, forehead. God. Or be two up. 
and you draw a, fro- a frost and then a cultist. You're fine. You're still fine, right? Yeah. So it looks like we will be believers um, and get the cultist yeah. token. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, so that brings us to Ice and Death Part 1. Um, we start off with a plane crash, of course. We talked about that already. Um, and one partner is just going to die no matter what, unless you have your um, plot armor. Um, Ice and Death Part 1. Again, I'm going to be a broken record about there's not many choices to make. Uh, but the mm-hmm. choice here is really about what camp you want to resign at. So uh, as a kind of refresh for those who haven't played this in a long time. Uh, there's all these locations they all have a shelter value Um, you got to clear off the clues and then you can resign there and that becomes your camp Uh, the camp does a lot of things for you it determines like how much xp you get it determines how many people go missing for the next scenario Um, i think it, it determines the next resources for the next scenario so it does a ton of things for you um and they vary all the way from like shelter zero to shelter eight um so really the big quote-unquote choice for this scenario is which camp to resign at and i feel like after you say the word choice Mm -hmm. (laughs) yes maybe a little bit more like an aspiration than a choice (laughs) as if there is one yeah yeah there is one like if you could pick which one would you go to um and so the the top kind of shelter value is the crystalline cavern that's shelter eight um and so it might seem like that's where we want to aspire to and i would argue i think it actually is for iron man purposes but in my solo and two-player games i've actually intentionally gone for like shelter seven because i wanted to play check uh scenario ice and death part two Mm. um which lets you like do some things like clear frost out of your bag and clear tech alilis out of your deck. Um, and so like you can kind of intentionally force yourself to play that just to like do some cleanup. But um, I'm going to argue and we'll talk about this when we get to ice and death part two, that for Iron Man purposes, it's better just to skip that one. So I think mm-hmm. our aspiration should be crystalline cavern. What do you all think? Mm-hmm. Sorry, were you expecting an argument against Christian? <laughs> <laughs> I guess I wasn't, but <laughs> didn't want to just well assume. playing devil's advocate. <laughs> should we really? So, so here's the thing, though. Chris mm-hmm. Lyon Cavern, we mm-hmm. get uh, eight shelter value. Mm-hmm. All of our current partners live. Mm-hmm. If we go to Ice and Death Part Two, the only experience we can get is experience we didn't get from Ice and Death Part One. Uh, and that's all based off your shelter value. Well, if we if we don't have any partners crossed off, we're not even going to go to part two. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, we go yeah, to Crystalline yeah. Cavern. Um, also, just playing Crystalline Cavern, I believe, gets you a frost token. Or sorry, part, playing, part two. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Playing Ice and Death part two gets yes, you a frost token. It does. That's another reason to just So avoid. hard yeah. skip. Yeah. Also, this is us skipping a scenario, which we are totally yeah. allowed to do. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and we won't miss out on anything, so we can finish this earlier, because reasons. Yeah, and we we did talk about this on the stream a little bit. The idea of considering part two as as like a cleanup opportunity, it can be if you're mm-hmm. lucky, but you it costs you a frost token. You add a frost yeah. token to the bag to even start the scenario, not, mm-hmm. and yeah. if you get lucky and you get access and find and complete both of the the available frost removal then you remove two but i think you're more likely to to probably like end at net neutral than than Mm -hmm. actually come out on top agreed yeah and it's not even like for everyone out there to prove me wrong too (laughs) no i agree with you like going through this it just felt like it's not worth the juice is not worth the squeeze um the frost mm-hmm. token is not worth it. Um, if you could like use it as an XP farm and get a bunch of XP from it, then it might be worth it. But you can't because mm-hmm. that's it's just pretty much scales with how many people are missing, how much um, XP you can get, and so like unless we're planning to totally fail part one, it, there's not a lot of XP there. So it's just 
save time, save our frost token, just skip ahead. Um, but yeah, like, <laughs> as you were pointing out, Sean, it's an aspiration. So we're definitely going for Crystalline Cavern, but if we have to settle for something else, then obviously it's because we don't really have a choice in the matter and something went terribly wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and it also bears mentioning that Crystalline Caverns, aside obviously from being the highest objectively uh, uh, camp value or shelter value, it's also a three per investigator clues on a five shroud location. So, mm-hmm. like, if you're shooting for it, you gotta lock in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, with level zero decks. <laughs> yeah, and and I think the way to play it is we kind of like beeline for Crystalline Cavern, make sure it's cleared, ready to go. And then we can do our, like, extra work that we want to do. So the other thing in this scenario is supplies that you can get for future, um, that matter in future scenarios. So it's like, once your camp is secure, then we can try to get some of those key supplies that we want to get. Um, but I don't think we, like, spend time trying to get them first and then end up, like, screwing ourselves and not having enough time at the end. I think as the... I, I, we haven't talked about our decks yet, uh, mm-hmm. and I know we aren't solid on them yet, uh, but me being possibly Harvey as the Kluver, like my goal is to get to the, the Crystalline Cavern as soon as possible, and mm-hmm. then just stay there, and just yeah. mine clues. <laughs> so They call it a mine? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um... So pretty straightforward, I think, for Ice and Death Part 1. Just get the Crystalline Cavern, grab some supplies along the way, um, and then get out of there and move on Mm -hmm. to the next part. Um, So we already talked, kind of talked through Ice and Death Part 2 and all the reasons we want to um, skip. Uh, I think, like, if you're going to do this as, as part of Iron Man, it's because you did end up at a different camp and some of your people got stolen away missing. I guess that's mm-hmm. worth talking about. Like, under what conditions would we play part two? Like, if even one partner goes missing? If certain partners go missing? Like, who are we willing to sacrifice? I'm, I'm kind of in camp certain partners. Mm-hmm. Like, Kensler, obviously, mm-hmm. we well, go Ken- after. Well, Kensler, I hope, would have plot armor. Sure. Oh, plot armor from oh, getting from you know going what? MIA too. Th- this does not count plot armor. So yeah. So if Kensler goes yeah. away, we need to. Yeah. This one. Yeah. Yeah. And I I would make an argument for Claypool too. Yeah. yeah that's the way you balance the plot armor with it. Is this is a separate thing because yep. you have some control of it. Yeah. It's not just the, the mm-hmm. shuffle and then good luck. Yeah. Yeah. This is a this is a non plot armor grab. I would argue, yeah, Kensler or Claypool. Those are my two that I want to keep forever. Question for you guys. When we're actually doing this at Iron Man, Mm -hmm. do we want to shuffle the partners up, the physical cards, and have some poor one of us make the the pull? Or do we want to have the app randomize and spit it out at us? Oh, no. One of us is going to grab that card. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. (laughs) And that that is that person's fault. Mm-hmm. Yep, yeah, yep, yep. naturally, and we blame um, them for what happens. Yeah, yeah sure. of course, we'll talk yeah, about for years afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah they, two years from now, hey, remember that time? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they have to get a, a in memoriam tattoo of that partner on their bodies. <laughs> Another stretch goal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. It was mentioned in our chat, and I think it's worth going back for a second to mention, um, because this comes up a few times in the campaign, um, what I was mentioning earlier, that a lot of uh, kind of resolutions don't really have a huge impact. Um, so, for example, if for some reason we got defeated in Ice and Death um, Part 1 uh, or, you know, run out of time, it's, it's not a, a huge deal. At that point, like, you suffer whatever consequences you do, um, but then you just choose a location that has no clues to become the camp. So, like, obviously we don't want that to happen, but it's not the end of the world if it does. And adds a Tekka Lili to your deck. Yeah, so you you can recover from it, unlike some other scenarios and other Mm -hmm. campaigns. So, after Ice and Death Part 2, 
we get to Ice and Death Part 3, which, again, is kind of an optional uh, scenario in terms of you can skip this one. Uh, and this is a choice of, like, there's a bunch of creatures coming, we can choose to fight creatures or run. And this one is really interesting. Um, let's talk through the whether we're going to... This is one that we need to really talk through whether we're going to play this one or not. Because when mm. I came into this, I was like, this is something I never really paid close attention to in the campaign log. I just assumed if you flee from these enemies that would have a really negative effect on you later. And it just doesn't. There's there's like no consequences for running to the mountains. Mm -hmm. In fact, you get an extra partner visit in the interlude, which we'll talk about the interludes, but you get to visit a certain amount of partners. You get an extra one for fleeing. Whereas if you play this one, you get a frost token, just like part two. Um, you go through and fight. Uh, so the only difference here really the compelling reason for me to play this one versus not playing it well we can talk about whether it's compelling or not is xp so if mm -hmm. you play ice and death part three defeat yes. all the enemies you <laughs> get five just a flat five xp um if you just defeat some of them you get two xp for each seeping nightmare um in the victory display so thoughts <laughs> Is the XP well, before, worth it? Before we even dive into mm -hmm. that math on it, and you know, I'm usually in, in mm -hmm. the camp of let's get the XP, mm -hmm. we should clarify. So, in addition to fighting the Doom Clock and the scenario with Iron Man, you are fighting the real life clock. Sure. Mm -hmm. And we have confirmed that um, the uh, Game Center will be open for 13 hours for mm. us that day. Mm -hmm. So. This might be a little early to just start thinking about dropping because of time, but as we know from past mm -hmm. Iron Man's, that first scenario can just go real sideways and you need to start trimming. So <laughs> yeah, level level setting there for, for that argument, but now I'd love to hear what you guys think on the XP side. I think based on the XP, Ian, you, you made a, uh, a uh, an XP chart of total mm -hmm. possible XP versus realistic XP. Uh, we're looking at 35 XP. So mm -hmm. if you want to just flee to the mountains, you can probably still get 33 to 31, which seems low, but I think that this campaign allows lower decks to succeed. Mm. But goodness, I would love to get that five bonus. <laughs> the extra that XP. Is... <laughs> oh. I think it might hinge on a couple of other things mm -hmm. too like if we manage to get crystalline caverns mm -hmm. and we for sure don't play part 2 i'm more amenable to playing part 3 yeah if yes. there are specific like um uh, supply items that we want to clear up mm -hmm. that can be one reason to do it uh the, the extra vp is nice mm -hmm. i think once you know once if, you know, if we've got like 10 XP a piece going into it, like we're probably pretty okay. Mm -hmm. However, 5 XP is not enough to make me go, we must play it. So, so if we are, yeah. you know, the first couple or the first one takes too much time or we're just feeling good and we want to skip it, I'm, I'm not going to kick up a fuss. Yeah, there, yeah, there's also the middle ground like we've done in some other Iron Mans where we can start this one. Um, and kind of see how it's going. Like, I, I think usually, like, in Ice and Death Part 3, you get a pretty good sense of how you're doing um, pretty mm -hmm. early on. And so it could be one where, like, we start it up, see... Especially with, like, the checkpoint system, we don't have to, like, clear everything and set up a whole new scenario. We're kind of rolling over into this. If we see things are going well, we can play it through, um, both in terms of time and how our decks are doing. And if not, we can like take the option to still run away from the scenario. Yeah, so it sounds like Ice and Death Part 1, obviously we have to play. Skip 2, 3 is kind of judgment call in the moment. And it also, it, and we're going to talk about our team comp. Mm. I'm going to be enemy management, but I'm not going to be like high damage enemy mm. management. So that's also a discussion we have to have as to whether... Our, our main killer can kind of actually shoulder the brunt of the work because I'm going to be really good at taking out chuds. Like, I'll mm. take out non-elite enemies left and right, but once it comes to the honest fight, I'm not going to be able to do, like, full killer work. Yeah. So that's a piece of it, too. 
Yeah, it's worth talking about. The Seeping Nightmares are 363, so they're not like full bosses, but collectively, you, as a group, they're kind of You get all of four of them. Yeah. Yeah, you get all four of them in different corners, yeah. so you do kind of have to split up a bit. Yeah, it is interesting. Like, Edge of the Earth feels kind of lower on the XP side uh, mm -hmm. than you might expect. But again, um, I think you were t mentioning that, Scott, that it, it's also a campaign that, like, it feels like you can um, do well with lower amounts of XP. Like, it's not mm -hmm. as demanding taxing as some other campaigns. So, yeah, just kind of depends on where we're at, I guess. That takes us to the first interlude, which I think is a good chance now to have that full, like, partner discussion we have a full tab on this spreadsheet for partners um, because in the interludes and spoiler alert, there's three sp interludes. Um, each interlude, you get to select three partners to visit with or four if you fled to the mountains in Ice and Death Part 3. Uh, and they each give you a little something. Um, and so what I did is went through, and this is completely my own subjective rankings, so we can have some discussion here, about... Uh, so I separated each, there's nine partners, into essentially three tiers, uh, green, yellow, and red. Um, so the top tier are the ones I think are most important to visit, who give you the most bang for the buck. Uh, yellow, the second tier is kind of in between, they, are, they can be useful. Um, and then the red tier three is like, um, kind of that, those would be our, our last choices if, if that's what we were left with. Um, so these kind of partner power rankings are based completely on their interlude usefulness and not like mm -hmm. their gameplay effects when you choose them. Cause I think that's a little bit of a different discussion. Um, mm -hmm. some of them have really useful kind of like gameplay effects, but they're not as useful in the interludes. And to that point, I think it's, it's cool to get those when they're available, but I also mm. think given that any one of them might get taken out you can't like count on having those abilities mm -hmm. available to you right yeah yeah that that's kind of why i wanted to make this list because it's like okay is there someone still in tier one alive take it if not okay move down to tier two and kind of mm -hmm. work your way through that way um so in tier one i had kensler obviously for the kind of story effect um claypool removing a frost token is just huge mm -hmm. um, that's why there was discussion earlier about maybe giving claypool plot armor i imagine and uh dyer lets an investigator remove five tickle which again like those two are handling the two big features of the campaign frost and tickle mm -hmm. um so that's why i put them in kind of the tier one i feel like if they are available we take them mm -hmm. like kensler mm -hmm. i assume we're going kensler uh, because that's the ultimate uh, victory. Sure. Claypool is the next one because mm -hmm. honestly, keeping that bag clean is just like that's just math, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you can remove frost tokens, you want to remove frost tokens. Yeah. Like, yeah, they're just a minus one until you have two, <laughs> and then it's a problem. D don't be like me in my last edge of the earth campaign that i did as part of this planning i maxed out on frost tokens <laughs> mm -hmm. it was all bad yeah don't yeah. do that <laughs> don't do that <laughs> like once you hit like four frost tokens yeah it's a real problem they right? come like, up so, so often like they oh. replicate in there i think <laughs> and even just having yeah and even just having one like i realize it's just a minus one but it still throws off the math enough no, it's, right? it's at least a minus one. Right, exactly. And as soon as you have two, it's like, well, yeah. you draw a frost token. It's like, well, now I have two <laughs> auto fails in the bag. It's crazy how often they clump together, too. Like, yeah. <laughs> why do they always just pull out another frost token? Uh, just one of those things. So the next tier, I had Sinha, the doctor who heals physical trauma. Um, Ashavak who heals mental trauma, so the two trauma ones together. Um, and then Ellsworth, who is the one who does like scenario specific stuff. So Ellsworth will let you um start the next location with um no clues at the starting location, so you can just kind of or half clues, sorry, no not no clues, um, so that you can get going a little faster. Um 
I personally think trauma removal is obviously useful, and in some cases, you might take that over the Tekalili if you just don't have a Tekalili problem or the trauma is more bothersome to you. So I could see doing that, but I kind of have these in the middle tier. Makes sense to me. And you can also like remove damage or horror from a partner, but let's be honest, we're probably not going to do that. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> However, we do we are hopefully going to be packing some healing for ourselves that might eventually <laughs> like our spillover healing might get used on partners. We'll see. Yeah. Um and then coming in in the bottom tier is some stuff that could be useful, but uh like down fourth one investigator begins next scenario with two additional cards. Like and I'm also bo- basing this on four player like solo getting two additional cards next scenario sure like one out of four investigators getting two two additional cards compared to one of these other things yeah Mm. um and same thing with hiroko's one investigator starts with three additional resources um and then you know cookie one investigator gets a bonus xp like sure i mean if someone's like one away from something i guess (laughs) um like conditionally i could see situations where any of these could be useful but it's just like in a in a broad sense overall i would consider these like in the bottom yeah but you know maybe that depends on your investigator composition maybe there's someone who's like super resource heavy and they need a boost of resources or looking for a certain card maybe in those situations you'd take those yeah, you know, I, I am the one I am going to challenge on is mm-hmm. I do think Ellsworth, as far as like, I guess, never mind. You said this this power rating was based purely on their, their interlude mm, stuff, yeah. wasn't it? Ellsworth is one of my favorite ones to have actually out in the field right um is he is the one who you during a you can blank a treachery for one person's turn and that can be yeah that can be very very huge especially with that oh god what's the freaking one that just discards your whole hand after you discover a clue oh yeah pull i think that's polar mirage i hate that one yeah 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 similarly with danforth where i have him kind of in this third tier for interlude abilities but i find his like in-game ability to be useful to like draw you cards to kind of counter the way that tekalili's like steal your card draw mm-hmm. um so that's kind of the partner interlude stuff so like even if you don't the listeners out there don't agree with my exact rankings i think if you're playing iron man it's useful to do this kind of ranking for your own group just so that you don't have to sit there like burning time thinking about which partners are we going to visit and uh having yes. that debate in person i think it's useful to have some kind of shared like agreement beforehand so you could just kind of go through that really quickly and do those visits if iron man has taught me anything it's that mental shorthand is mm-hmm. invaluable yeah One mental shorthand I saw last year was uh, one person was playing Mandy and had a bunch of searching uh, things in their deck and they'd actually taken little stickers and and stickered the corner of the sleeve based on which search it would be eligible for. Mm -hmm. So if it's like an insight, it was yellow. If it was... I don't know, an event, it would be this color or whatever. So when they drew like three or four or five, six cards off the top of their deck or searching for whatever, they could just look for the stickies and then know those are the cards they could search for, which was incredibly that's, intelligent. That's, so. that's smart. <laughs> yeah. That seems like the only way you could justify playing Mandy <laughs> yeah. and Iron Man. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, any mental energy you could save is huge. Yeah, Wandering so. Took, that's who it was. Wandering mm-hmm. Took, mm-hmm. he's a smart guy. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and yeah. I will say, uh, Ian, mm-hmm. based on Polar Mirage existing, mm-hmm. you and I need to talk about who's taking logical reasoning, and mm. if we are both taking two copies of logical <laughs> reasoning. <laughs> that's because yes, that's totally fair. That's one card to save five cards, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Polar Mirage is a beast for sure. Is that one a terror? It is a terror. Oh. Yeah, Mirage is terrible. Oh, um, another another thing to keep in mind for the interludes is also like 
they might be dead and so instead you can like loot their uh, bodies for stuff right. um so i no I've... no you find a forever home for their misbegotten <laughs> <Loot> their <bodies. laughs> yes. um so i we don't have to go through these um all the way through but i similarly created three tiers for their uh their special assets or cards that you can get if they're Ooh. dead so a similar idea like if you're going through the three tier and like people are dead you can look through the three the green tier of dead assets and kind of see which ones are most valuable to grab and which ones are kind of in the middle or the bottom i probably should have done four tiers because on you is a tier all by himself um <laughs> <laughs> true <laughs> when can get on you you get on you i think is kind of the 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 main Accurate. logic here and yeah. i know on you's everyone's favorite girl but mm-hmm. like if we get on you she's mine right yes just that, just like logically that's fair yeah yeah okay. glad to have that out of the way appreciate it um, who are you playing again <laughs> i'm gonna be playing kaimani yes yeah uh-huh. yeah on you Definitely. is your yeah is their best um, girl. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to be playing Kaimon Yu. <laughs> Ooh, Vinny uh, B brings up bad news. Polar Mirage is not in your threat area. So... Mm. Whoa, whoa. Logical reason does not work. Ellsworth yeah. it is. Well, it has to be logical reasoning level four. So I guess... Um, yeah, Orphic Theory is another good, another good pull. Mm. Yeah. Orphic some... Theory basically does what Ellsworth does. Yeah, there's some other options there. Um, some other greatest hits of the dead assets or dead special cards. Um, I think Claypool's first is really good for a similar reason to Claypool being able to cancel a frost token, just very good to have. And Danforth's collected works of Poe to being able to search for tech lilies and remove that could another one again. That kind of depends mm-hmm. on your how clean you are able to keep your decks of tech lily, which. I think in four player, like, I feel like they're not going to be as bunch. Like in solo and two player, you can get a bunch in one deck, but we are going to be getting them constantly um, mm-hmm. just because of four, how four player games go. One thing I was thinking yep. with my Harvey deck is that I'm going to offer card draw to many players mm. so that we can, like, churn through the tech mm. lilies when needed. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That'll be good. I uh, always love to have a Harvey around. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Never sad to see it. So in Interlude One, this is where we get our first opportunity to play Fatal Mirage. But that's only if we have three or more names crossed out. Um which, which yep. if we've had our <laughs> if we've done our job right, we're not playing Fatal Mirage at this point. So I, I kind of want to punt talking about Fatal Mirage to the end. That's how I've been doing it in the spreadsheet, just because it's a weird, like, middle part of it. So let's talk about climbing up a mountain, Forbidden Peaks. <laughs> um, again, straightforward scenario. The choice, there is no choice. Get up the mountain or don't. Uh, <laughs> that's pretty much how it goes. There's a variety of stuff that happens in the intro, depending on who's alive um, and what special um, supplies you got. Like, for example, if there's no Alaya and no Wooden Sledge, then you get a Frost Token. Um, if there's no Claypool, you get a Frost Token or Trauma. So the way I kind of think about these is there's can't really like have too much anxiety or spend a lot of time thinking about these because they're mm-hmm. either going to hit you or they're not. Like, there's not much you could do to plan for them. Other than potentially trying to like get the wooden sledge and hope that Eli is alive, um, but other than that, like it's it comes down to some random chance, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, this scenario is where another one bites the dust. Uh, so at this point, if we haven't played Fatal Mirage, we're not going to have any re- resolute checkmark people. So again, it's either going to be random or plot armor is going to save someone for this one. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's, I mean, Forbidden Peaks, uh, this is another one where, like, let's say we fail, everyone's defeated, or we're doomed out, like, the team finds another way through the mountains, you get an extra partner visit in the interlude, life goes on, um, the big thing here is you just lose all the supplies, those special supply cards, 
Um, mm-hmm. That's kind of the big penalty. But it doesn't have any, like, campaign repercussions. This is another one where I was sure that, like, later on it would come back to bite you. But it doesn't. So try Sorry. to win. And if you don't, um, you can bounce back. It's it's kind of forgiving in that way. Hmm. We do love that. Yeah, this weirdly I, enough is one of my favorite scenarios in the mm-hmm. entire game, or in, in sorry, in the entire campaign. Yeah, uh, because it feels like I'm climbing up a mountain. <laughs> like that, that yeah, I, I know that sounds ludicrous, but even in Dunwich, like the um, the Miskatonic Museum one, mm. felt like I'm exploring a museum, and the train one felt like I'm riding on a train and fighting my way up. And this one felt like I'm climbing up mountains. So, yeah, I mean, I do appreciate a big map. And of course, Ice and Death gives you a giant map. Mm-hmm, so I mm-hmm. do like that. The, the like the next progression is all right. Small ass map. <laughs> and and we're just going to do as much as we can with six locations, mm-hmm. uh, which it, it's cool. This is what I'm worried about, uh, particularly mm. in four player. Mm-hmm. When we were looking through this on the stream, I think. I think I feel a little bit better now because for some reason in my head, a lot of the treacheries that will like kick you down a location or do do some nasty thing to you target everyone at your location. And I don't think that's actually the case. I think that was just (laughs) that was just my Uh, mind inflating mm. it. Um, But for those situations where uh, being at the same location matters four player is going to be tough because the, again the encounter deck is just going to have more and more opportunities to combo those mm-hmm. things mm-hmm. yeah it, it's funny because i think i have a memory of us talking about this campaign and i think most of us picked this one as our favorite of the of the campaign which is interesting because it is actually every other scenario pretty much has a big map in this campaign except for this one um mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it wasn't something I necessarily thought about until earlier in this episode where you talked about four player edge, um, Sean and like the advantage of big maps is you're probably a little more spread out. And so things aren't going to bunch up, but since it's a small map, we're probably going to be working our way up the mountain together. Um, and we've talked a little bit about it, but just emphasizing here, like more than any other campaign, this is the campaign of treacheries attaching to locations like that's it's mm. shtick and so mm-hmm. in four player those things are just going to start stacking on our locations um as well as enemies mm-hmm. of course so yeah it's gonna i feel like it's gonna be a little bit of a scrap up the mountain yeah and one thing i want to point on this is just a strategy thing that i've had to remind myself of every time that i play this is uh, I actually think it's generally an overall better strategy to take your time in the first half of the mm. scenario, build up, get your things set up, and then start ascending the mountain. Because when that first agenda pops and the Terror of the Stars comes out, the Terror of the Stars becomes more difficult to handle the higher mm. up you are. Mm. So if you're, if you're racing and you know just barely keeping pace with the encounter deck but getting up the mountain as fast as you can, as I have done in the past, and then Big Boy hops out and he's like a 4-12-4, four, mm. it, it's a worse time. So I do think uh, the, the best strategy is to take your time in the first half, clear the terror of the stars as quickly as you can, and then go full out for the peak. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's actually a good point. Like... It's almost like the first part of the scenario. Kluvers build up your full kit, basically. Um, obviously, killers get ready for the terror. Bide your time. And then after that, like assuming you really set up, you should just be able to like blow through the last few locations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then the I mean the the terror is just not fun because regardless of like whether you've evaded or damaged it, it just knocks everyone down a level mm-hmm. every turn. So you're going to be spending so much time just moving back into it yeah. to, to deal with it. So, like, the easier that is and the fewer failed tests you have in that process, the the better the time is going to be. And there is a choice in the intro as far as who or what you do. And based on who has died, you can get a trauma. Yeah. So Yeah, either a frost or a trauma for if yeah. we're missing either Claypool or Takata. Which I feel like the choice there is trauma, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I feel like it's mm-hmm. whenever it's this or frost, 
You pick the other thing, I think. I mean, yes. Trauma can be healed, and we're not bringing healing, which is, I don't know, maybe something we should talk mm-hmm. about. Yeah. But, <laughs> Have a little talk about but, that. <laughs> but, like, one trauma yeah. on one investigator is way yeah. better than a frost in the bag. Agreed. Because the frost affects everyone. Yeah. Um, and also, and maybe we, we need to talk about healing because there's weaknesses <laughs> that now deal with healing. So Yeah, that require you heal them off. Yeah, yeah. so... That's a, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I think once we get through the these last scenarios, we can have a little uh, a little chin wag, as our <laughs> friends yeah, the yeah, pod yeah, would yeah. say. Uh, um, a little palaver. Yeah, a little palaver about our decks and uh, some of these kind of card, like, tech considerations. Yeah. <laughs> Um, cause there's definitely some things to talk about there. Um, mm-hmm. ideally so, we'd like to climb to the top of the mountain, right? Yeah. Ideally. Like if I had to choose yeah. top of the mountain or not, I'd probably pick top of the mountain. <laughs> um, yeah. and then after that we get another <laughs> interlude. So same deal. Um, the nice thing about the partner visits is they're pretty much always the same with the exception of Ellsworth. As I mentioned, he has the um, kind of scenario-specific stuff. But they all usually tend to have something to do with, like, clues. Um, so for the next scenario, it would be you discover half clues from the starting location. But everything else is pretty much the same like we talked about. So if you have your partner power rankings ready, they should still be legit for this next part. Um, and that brings just, us... Just to check... Yeah. Sorry, just checking mm-hmm. in. The visit with partners, I believe you get an extra one if everyone is defeated in Forbidden Peaks. Yeah, or or doomed out. Um, yeah. So pretty much any time you fail, you get rewarded with another partner visit to like make up okay. for it. <laughs> yeah. That's fair. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Consolation. It's kind of it? interesting. Um, okay. I don't think it's worth like intentionally failing or anything like that. But No, I think, I think yeah, passing is way better yeah Yeah. especially xp wise like i feel like a lot of this is uh exercise and getting some more xp for the finale Mm -hmm. (laughs) um Mm -hmm. so that brings us to city of the elder things this is where we get like the most variability in the campaign because there's three different versions of this scenario we mentioned it earlier but the surviving partners vote to see which path you're gonna take Uh, And then that different version changes what the map looks like. It changes the encounter sets you have to deal with. It also changes some of the bosses um, that you might need to deal with. Uh, And so, like, at the beginning of the scenario, again, there's some more intro stuff that's dependent on, like, who's still alive? What supplies do you have? Uh, Again, not not too much you could do about it uh, unless you're, like really looking to avoid some of these and you give the that partner a plot armor but uh there are some new weaknesses (laughs) or conversely (laughs) yeah (laughs) you start taking out dissenting votes yeah yeah. um you do get some new weaknesses potentially like special campaign weaknesses frostbitten and possessed which are both Mm -hmm. not great but again not a ton you could do that's based on mala and avery uh and uh dire is if you don't have dire, dire. then you get a possessed weakness yep. yes yes um so this is one where i created a whole separate tab for city of the elder things comparison because even though we're not necessarily able to totally control it unless we want to like intentionally kill people off i oh. wanted to know like because I think there's a thing in there, like, if there's a tie that we can choose. So I really wanted to know for ourselves what is the best path. And I have landed, landed on that, I think... Um, so basically, I set up a comparison of the different elements and how they vary across the versions. Um, I kind of highlighted which version has the best of those things. And I think version 2 and version 3 um, are the best and the reasons why is essentially um version two and i if i had to pick i'd say version two for one main reason version two avoids shogoths no shogoths um Mm. which is huge because speaking of huge uh (laughs) one of the shogoths is is a is a beefy one 
um, with in four player the rampaging Shogoth is a three twelve one, and in version by referred to as the beefy Shogoth. Yes, <laughs> and version one of the this scenario, you have to face both the terror of the stars and potentially rampaging Shogoth. Um, that's why I'm not a big fan of version one, even though I think version one has the best map. So version one has what I'm calling like a square map. It's kind of squarish. So I think it's easier to move around. Uh, ver- version two is kind of shaped like a mountain up and down. Um, and then version three is like a stairs. So version one has like the best map for movement in my book, but everything else sucks compared to version two and version three. So version two, you, yeah, you avoid the Shogoths, um, you remove Terror of the Stars, so you don't have to face that boss, uh, and, uh, you also, there's, like, a potential bonus that you get, um, in a certain part of the scenario, and for version two, you get to remove all Tekalili, which is kind of nice. So, version three also has some good things, like, even though as Shogoths, you don't have to deal with Terror of the Stars too. Um, you don't get an Elder Thing token added to the bag, which version 1 and version 2 both did. And you also get to remove other Elder Thing tokens as it's like special bonus. So it's a little That's bit complicated, great. lots of little variations. Um, again, I think this is where your group just needs to think about this. Although, again, like mm. you don't super get a lot of control over it, unfortunately. Maybe we should just kill the people who are going to try to get us to go to version one because it sucks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> who is let's, it that votes for version let's one? Pull up that. Let's... I'm pretty sure Kensler's one of them, unfortunately. So. No! <laughs> <laughs> Let me see if I could pull it up real oh, quick. Oh, Kensler and Ellsworth. Oh, oh no. Oh, no. Why do they got to do that to us? <laughs> We just have to start seeing where other people are dropping off on the others, and then yeah. one person drops from. from you know v2 then we we crush the rest of them even out can, the numbers one way or another yeah <laughs> yeah oh yeah so group one is kensler ellsworth and doctor dr sin huh so i really uh, only care about kensler there i think yeah i think so as long as our bag is clean at this point if yeah. we're having trouble with frost then well frost is claypool and he's in group three claypool. so Oh, uh, El- see, yeah, I keep getting yeah, Ellsworth and Claypool. I, yeah, it happens. <laughs> I feel like we want to try and get path three. Because Claypool and Dyler, or Dyer, I like the most. Yeah, we don't want those ones to die. Yeah, so it may be we end up on a version three, which is ex- yeah. also acceptable. Yeah, that this was the top an, three for sure. This was an aspect of the campaign which, like, I'm never gonna crunch this like normally playing it. So it's just like, oh, what version did I get? Oh, cool. But like, yeah. Now I yeah. now I really feel like I understand what the differences are. Mm-hmm. Which I think in lore version one, if I remember right, is like the center of the city. So it kind of makes sense why it's like mm-hmm. <laughs> there's a lot happening there. Not the best spot. Um, yeah, oh, we will oh, see. Yeah. Version one of Heart of the City. So, as part of uh, City of the Elder Things, another one bites the dust, of course. So, again, just be aware that another partner will be killed off there. And then the ending of City of the Elder Things is you're either finding a hidden tunnel, which, again, another kind of campaign note that doesn't really have any effect. Um, or you're guided to the hidden tunnel, which gets you an extra partner visit. So <laughs> you'll probably seen there's a common theme here, which is if you're defeated or doomed out, like you suffer the consequences of that, the normal consequences, you get an extra partner visit and you keep going. At least you got friends you can talk to about it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited. I'm very excited for four player city of the elder things. Yeah. However, <clears throat> traditionally oh, uh, <laughs> i have terrible luck no, with no. <laughs> the, the configuration of of the random locations mm. like the ones that are supposed to be like shortcuts to help, like help you with the movement almost always end up like one or two locations away from one another mm. and uh, so i hope we have better luck for iron man yeah i get. i guess that's this is kind of like rng the scenario right because then you have the random map and then the locations are random within it. And then the placement of the keys on top of those locations is, is also. Yeah. Yeah. 
Interesting. Well, and it's what makes it my favorite scenario in this campaign, mm. but also for the purposes of Iron <laughs> yeah. Man, it's going to make me produce a lot of stomach acid. Yeah. I think. yeah. And I guess another thing to think about is that this is a place to pick up XP in a scenario, in a campaign that doesn't give out a ton. Um, like, just to give an idea of some of the numbers, like, Ice and Death Part 1 is 9 total possible XP. Part 3 is 5. Forbidden Peaks is 9. City of the Elder Things is 13. Um, now, you're not necessarily going to get all that, but that just gives you an idea of, like, of the normal scenarios in the campaign that says the most total possible XP um, available. And that's mostly from, like... To me, that from, just like, signals. Good. Those are good. I was gonna say most of that XP is from like collecting and spending those those tokens. So if you're able to, yeah. it's it's kind of an opportunity to like flex a little bit if you can and try to get some extra XP. Yeah. <clears throat> Whenever there's that much in play, it just signals to me that you're not gonna get it all. <laughs> Nanny boo boo. Yeah. But you know, we'll see. Yeah. I mean, and it is Sean a... busting out the technical terms. <laughs> <laughs> And it, like yes. and and one thing compared to like other campaigns, since there isn't like a ton of like hurt, hurting you if you fail, like I guess in theory you could be a little bit more risky in trying to farm that extra XP. It, it still gives me anxiety just saying that sentence out loud, but I know in theory yeah. it's true. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think by the time we're here, we're gonna have either a good handle on mm. XP and everyone's feeling okay with the way their deck's running, or we're gonna be like behind and desperate for sure. it. Sure. I can't imagine there's gonna be too much in between. Yeah. So here's hoping for the former. Yeah. <laughs> really hope so. So interlude three is the third interlude and the final one. Again, same deal, same partner effects. Uh, except Ellsworth lets you look at the ancient facilities um, before you play a Heart of Madness. Uh, but other than that, everything's the same. And then we move on to the finale already, Heart of Madness, which is divided into two parts. Uh, so there's a bunch, again, a bunch of intro stuff that we don't really have control over. Uh, potentially handing out more trauma, more frost tokens... But then we get the option of whether we're going to skip part one or play part one. And I have a feeling this is mostly going to be decided by looking at the clock once we get to this yeah, point. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, we can talk about it all we want yes. right now. <laughs> yep. like, and sorry, Ian. Yeah. Looking, looking at the clock is equal to looking at the chat. And the number one Nick, who's not Nick, <laughs> City of the Elder Things does not defeat you upon dooming out. Yeah, it's a it's another yeah, we one that's run just off the like, clock there too. Yeah, Ooh. it's so like it's so interesting how this campaign really doesn't punish you for failing. Yeah, I was gonna say if you yeah, we're not gonna do it, but boy, somebody could do a really speedy speed run with all the failure, <laughs> and then just yeah. have to. I mean, the the final scenario might be tough. Well, it would be tough then, but I mean, they could also try and just die because finishing is winning. <laughs> I'd be interested in seeing a crew that's not going uh, taboo and just taking all the fail, like failing forward the entire time and mm -hmm. seeing how they do. That'd be very interesting to, to see. Yeah. So. I, don't, I don't understand the why taboo matters there. Uh, because there are certain cards that are very good that if you, you like, I could build a better level zero deck non taboo than a better deck that's 9 xp with taboo gotcha so that you're saying so they would have like a chance at at falling through yeah and be right. like hey just min maxing I... more yeah okay like okay. You, you can that makes sense you can choose like i mean we've been what uh up for like eight nine campaigns now worth of cards like there's just messed up things you can do without mm -hmm. taboo so mm -hmm. that's the idea i though this reminds me of not Innsmouth, the Circle Undone, where uh, where number one Nick is mentioning, um, there's no penalty for dooming out, where we play that one, that's the pandemic one. <laughs> the pandemic yeah. scenario that Nick never played. Yeah. 
<laughs> in the clutches of chaos. Yes, that's the one where we actually went. Eventually, got... I'm going to be the only person in the world. Who I remembers know that scenario. it's just going in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we went for the one XP that's available in that scenario, mm-hmm. and then intentionally doomed out because yeah. dooming out actually benefited us. That yeah. was so weird. So yeah. weird. Yeah, there, there's such weird like sinews to these campaigns once you start breaking them apart and like yeah. how some of the well, stuff and is it's, constructed. It's it's so cool because I would never know that if we didn't do this. Yeah, you yes. know, like yeah. I would have existed my entire career <laughs> playing Arkham Horror, the card game, assuming that dooming out is bad. You shouldn't. Yeah, do. like yeah. it's and just that's like not always the case. It's just drilled into our bones at this point. Like don't do that. Yeah. So you just assume that. Um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So deciding to skip is like. As much as I want to talk about, like, gameplay considerations, there are some here. Like, again, I feel like it's just going to be a call when we get to that time of night. (laughs) Um, And if we have time, we'll play it. And if we don't, we won't. Um, And I'm sure that'll be true for a lot of groups. Uh, So, Heart of Madness, let's say we were playing part one. Like, this is where it has the interesting, like, hubs and circles map. Um, Pretty big map. And so in part one, you're just trying to activate as many seals as you can. Um, And then based on what seals you collect and which ones you activate, that's going to kind of play into, you kind of carry over that work into part two. So that's the big like gameplay reason to play it. But otherwise, if you don't, you're kind of starting from scratch on part two. So definitely preferable to play it to make part two easier um, if you have the time to do it. However, not impossible if you need to just get part two on the table. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so there is kind of like a everyone resigns or defeated to this. That's not like a campaign killer at that point. Again, like you have some grace here as we've seen throughout the whole campaign. Other than there is an everyone is killed ending where if there's two activated seals at the same location. So don't cross the streams. Don't, Don't cross do the streams. Yeah, we'll have to like stop BusterCon at that point. <laughs> yeah. I think BusterCon that, is just canceled at that point. Have, <laughs> the bell would have such a massive dent on, in it if we <laughs> do that by accident. Oh my gosh! Could you imagine? Crack the bell. Like that's totally something that could happen in like hour ten of Iron Man. <laughs> yes, but. true. It's whether we whether we allow taxi backsies. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, oh, I moved into this location. Wait. <laughs> Do you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll just play with chess rules. It's not, the move's not final until you take mm. your hand off the piece. Yeah. <laughs> this is one of those rules that's, like, fun for flavor. And, like, when you're playing at home, it usually doesn't matter. But then, like, is so tightly designed to give me anxiety during Iron Man. Like it reminds me of in uh, dream eaters where there's the one, like if you say the name, then you lose like, Oh, that freaked me out so much when we were doing Iron Man. Yeah. (laughs) Oh God. We dodged that one really well. Yeah. I will say. Yeah. Um, So then it takes us to the very, very end. Heart of man is part two. Um, You're going around trying to defeat these pylons, um, and the seals help you, and then eventually when you get to the end, there's like a big run for it. So if everyone, as you can imagine, for the end of a campaign, this is where we finally get some consequences. (laughs) Um, If everyone is defeated, we lose. If we have Kensler around and did our Kensler things and defeated all pylons, we get that special Kensler ending. Um, if we don't have Kensler, but we defeated the pylons, we still get a good ending. Um, if we escape, but don't defeat all the pylons, then we get one of those win question marks, which is what we usually aren't going for, but we'll settle for, I suppose, if we have no choice. We will indeed. We will settle hard. Yeah. Yeah. Investigators win question mark is great, but investigators win period or exclamation mark. Is what we're going for. So. <laughs> the investigators finished! Exclamation point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so before we... So that's kind of the edge of the Earth plan. Um, although we'll talk about Fatal Mirage in a second. So, like, as promised, it's straightforward. Not a lot of decisions to make. 
I think the main decisions are really just all about what partners you're going to visit along the way, who you're trying to keep alive if you can. It's it's really all about the partners, keeping frost tokens out of the bag. Pretty simple, I think. So let's talk Fatal Mirage, though. Um, so yes. we, we, we're going to skip uh, Ice and Death Part 2, maybe Part Ideally. 3, depending. Um, Heart of Madness Part 1 will time depend it. But Fatal Mirage, are we going to play this one or not? So this is the scenario where you um, go confront memories of your partners, either living or dead. Um, if they're living, then you turn them resolute, which means they're protected. They can't be killed. Um, if they're dead, then you get some additional XP. Uh, so to my mind, the main reason to play this would be if there's a partner or two that we want to protect. And I think you only ever play this once. Like in Iron Man, it would be ludicrous to play this multiple times, I think. Yeah. Unless you're playing it at home. I think like if we are going for the best ending and we give Kensler the plot armor, for me, Claypool and Dyer are the two people we want to get out. Right. Yeah. And make resolute if possible. Yeah. Claypool for keeping the bag clean and dire for technically things. Like, I feel like everything else is just like really nice to have. Those two are need to have. Yeah, and I think you pointed out rightly so. If I pointed this out on the, on the stream and I had not really ever thought about this before, but if you have, you know, a handful of dead people, this can actually be a very easy XP farm. Mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. following the the branches of the dead partners will result in you finding the, the end of their path you do not have to tackle a boss and you get two xp out of it yeah so for i don't want to say minimal hassle because it's iron man anything's a hassle but for for a small amount of hassle depending on what our dead partner spread looks like mm -hmm. Uh, it might be worth considering if we're doing well on time, uh, uh, at least between City and Heart of Madness. Yeah, and maybe. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I think if things go how we hope they do, um, mm -hmm. the decision should be coming more towards the latter half of the day. So that time can really inform whether we have enough time to play it or not mm -hmm. at that point. I mean, just counting, too. Like, if we look at mm. Ice and Death 1, we hope to not play 2. Mm -hmm. So we're at Ice and Death 3, so that's two scenarios. Yep. Forbidden Peaks, we have to play 3. City of Elder Things, that's 4. Hard Madness, 5, 6, possibly. Yeah. And we could skip Part 3 of Ice and Death pretty easily, so... Yeah. As as mentioned, so... Yeah, yeah we... we... There's a lot of knobs and dials to, yeah. to lock in here. Yep. So even if we do take uh, Ice and Death Part 3, we could play Fatal Mirage number 7, which doesn't feel like a lot to me. I mean, we played 7 mm -hmm. last time with less complicated, or sorry, with more complicated maps. So Yeah. Yeah, because like the standard campaign is like 8 scenarios. If you play every single thing, including Fatal Mirage once in this campaign, it's 8. But we're already planning to skip one or two here, so in theory, we should have time for Fatal Mirage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and really have that plan of like protect Claypool, uh, maybe one other, and then XP farm the rest for whatever time we have. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, that's pretty much Edge of the Earth. I think we can like uh, talk through both some of the like notable scenario encounter cards. Uh, but also similarly talk through like our decks because that's gonna kind of inform like how we tech against these. Um, so let's talk a little bit about who we're planning on bringing at least right now. Well, I'll go first since I spoiled it already. Mm -hmm. um, so in so one thing that I kind of well I didn't I didn't I, I talked about it at the beginning of the stream. It's obviously not my original idea, but I do think that. Uh, Edge of the Earth specifically really wants early on and throughout everyone to be able to hit an honest uh, skill test with every stat, particularly to get those uh, those supplies early on. Um, 
So as everyone was kind of considering, it had been a while since I'd considered playing like a dodge tank and uh, uh, enemy manager. Um, that, that gets us agility. Uh, Kaimani is who I landed on because A, <laughs> I'm going to have a much better time if I'm not constantly getting owned by agility tests. <laughs> and, and There's quite a Edge few. Edge will do that to you. Yeah. Edge will absolutely just like uh, take chunks out of you if you can't hit uh, agility tests or, or cancel things. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, for a lot of the Eidolon enemies that punish you for fully defeating them, Kaimani is a really good mm -hmm. solution because Kaimani's extra evade ability is a discard and not a full defeat. Um, so ideally, I'll be able to dispatch a lot of the smaller enemies uh, with, with with minimal hassle and and far less repercussion than another killer would be able to. Yeah. On top of that, so so here's my main tech. Mm. This is it's. Let me throw this one at you guys. And I was talking about uh, this with Scott. So obviously I'm taking stealth. I'll be taking level three stealth. Uh, it's a great one for Kaimani. This is a very classic to me. <laughs> uh, uh, hotline voicemail that we got where someone called me out for being like, oh, stealth isn't that great with Kaimani because I <laughs> always forget that Kaimani's ability stacks atop of another evade mm -hmm. ability. It can be a basic evade, and sometimes it is, but it doesn't need to be. They can be an evade that you're doing with an event. It can be an evade that you're doing with stealth, and stealth is really, really good for it. On top of that, Ian, have you ever played this card in Kaimani? This card called Suggestion? I I have not. Do you remember what Suggestion does? Um, Let me pull up Healed. I, suggestion. Like, I remember vaguely. I know it's an evade <laughs> test. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a level four three cost spell in rogue. Um, has three charges, action, exhaust suggestion, evade. Add your willpower value to your skill value for this evasion mm -hmm. attempt. If you do not succeed by at least two, remove one charge from suggestion. Uh, and then it has a second ability when an enemy would attack you, spend a charge to cancel the attack. So you have a, a second ability there. So as I just mentioned, since Kaimani uses their ability atop of another evade ability. Using suggestion means that you add both your intellect through Kaimani's ability and your willpower to that <laughs> evade check. So you're coming in at a base 10 before you do nice. anything else. I love it. And then, you know, with, with stealth on top of that for, for other things, because both of them exhaust. So on, on those turns where I might need to do, uh, uh, do more than one, uh, I'll have those options. So yeah, uh, beyond that, I, I'm going to rock Hyperphysical Shotcaster, both for uh, some damage output, but then also I'm definitely going to be taking Reality Collapser. Um, hmm. If you remember, Re Reality Collapser is the one where you test any skill three. If you succeed, discard from play a non-weakness treachery that's not attached to an elite enemy. So yeah. that would be a really good way oh, to get God, rid of yes. some of those. Yes. Uh -huh. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and that's going uh, um, to be my first XP that I spend. I'll have this on scenario one because guys, I'm not going to forget this time that Kaimani starts with five XP. <laughs> oh, you're not. You're not Sean. I'm not going to forget it. It won't happen. Even after you showed us your deck list. And then I pointed out that you had five XP. <laughs> I've changed it since then. I won't forget again. <laughs> okay, okay. 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 Until the next time. <laughs> you're right. Uh, but yeah, so so that's kind of the idea. I'm going to have some flex clue gathering. I'm going to have pilfer. I'm going to have thieves kit. I'll have eon chart and grappling hook, obviously. I debated on what I want to do for ally. I'm between Janae and Delilah. Mm. Right now I'm looking at Delilah for a couple of reasons. One of them is I'm running stealth. So mm -hmm. very similar to, to um, Lola Santiago and Flashlight's interaction. You can stealth an enemy, take their evade down, and then do damage in that window with Delilah while it while it will cost you less. Mm -hmm. So for when I actually need to pour out some real damage, I'll have a better way, a better time doing it. Um, she's cheaper than Janae, and yeah, that's that's what I got so far. I, I do accept that Janae <laughs> might actually be a better pull, but we are playing Taboo, right? I think I'm so. assuming we're playing Taboo. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's like four XP I get to save going to Lila, right? 
Yeah. You know? But, but anyway. 4XP, is that worth Delilah versus Jeanne? I think so. And and it's sure. because Ian chose... It's not because. It's it's Part of it is because Ian also chose the investigator he did, which will be able to help with, with Delilah things, too. But yeah, mm-hmm. I, I will keep Jeanne in the old box, and if it makes more sense in the moment, I'll I'll, I'll upgrade to Jeanne <laughs> okay. uh, instead of Delilah. Right up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's if I remember right. I think part of your what factored into your decision of the evade uh, character too is thinking about Heart of Madness, like the nameless madness yes. enemies that if you evade them, it evades a bunch of other copies depending on how much you succeed by. Because I think originally mm-hmm. we didn't really have a evadey character. Yeah, yeah, and that that was a big part of it. And again, that suggestion. Even if I'm not going to be able to discard those enemies, I'll still be able to hit that test at a base 10. So between hopefully between Kaimani and our main killer taking big swings at those things, we'll be able to just, like, flatten them. Yeah. We'll roll out the blue carpet, baby. <laughs> yep. The black-blue iridescent carpet. Speaking of killer, do you want to talk about who I'm playing since you built it? <laughs> it's not final yet. I, I still need the other two to sign off on it, but we're currently looking at a Hank Sampson deck for Justin. Justin, have you played Hank at all yet? I have not, so I, I'm kind of excited because he was one that when I saw his um, health and sanity the, the first time I looked at the card, I'm like, oh no. And then I was like, oh wait, he's supposed to flip. Mm-hmm. So, so no, I'm excited to do it. And again, I appreciate you guys uh, building that for me with the trade off of I'm working on other BusterCon stuff in the background. Yeah. So the main idea here is main killer and also tanking for the the team. Um, so as far as damage goes, we're looking at like sledgehammer, chainsaw, and push to the limit. Uh, you know, obviously in addition to like active desperation and and kind of the normal stuff you might do. I think he's gonna be able to pour out some ridiculous damage. <laughs> um, because I don't know if you guys have the the push to the limit working mm-hmm. on level mm-hmm. four sledgehammers mm-hmm. <laughs> ability is so insane and awesome. Uh, so yeah, so that's that's Hank. Um, what we're what we're kind of hashing out still is what exactly the healing slash soak package looks mm. like. I feel like solemn vow is not something you actually want to take because I feel like Hank can't tank that amount of stuff but sure I don't know. well Maybe. the other the other thought was earthly serenity for just straight healing too but his his willpower is okay you know un- until you flip to to warden side then it's just you know good and not great so earthly serenity might be okay but it's also like since it's reliant upon a test it might fail us in a crucial moment mm-hmm. but i was trying to think of like what other healing hank has available I've got yeah. talismans of protection in there right now. Just, you know, if someone gets in a bad way, we can just slap that on mm-hmm. them and, and tank a little bit that way. Yeah, I feel like the way to go with Hank, because his, like, other side, the resolute side, like, stops him from being healed anymore is just, like, a bunch of soaks. Um, assets with, um, you know, damage or horror that you can take on them, and just, that's, like, his form of healing, really. Yeah. Peter well, and Peter I, and what's what's her name? Uh, uh, Jessica. Jessica. Yes. Jessica. Yeah. yeah. Jessica with some uh, charisma. Yeah, that's not bad. Something like that. The, as pointed out, though, I do think one of us needs to pack like actual, honest to god healing, because yeah. if one of us pulls, you know, the wrong mm-hmm. uh, uh, weakness that needs to be healed to to go away, then that's that's going to be a bad time. So. Yeah, that's we'll have to hash fair. that. Out, Is that so. something we can we can level up into though? Uh, healing. Yeah, it kind of feels like something that we can look at after drawing our weaknesses. Uh, I feel like I kind of want more soak rather than healing per se, um, d- depending on the weakness draw. Yeah, and that is, I mean, I think given the investigators we've chosen, any healing that Mm -hmm. we look at doing is going to be something we have to spend XP to get. Mm -hmm. So I think just inherently it will be a a call in the moment to kind of see how things are going and kind of what what we're looking at for for what we need. So that's the basics of Hank, but obviously uh, details are still to be finalized. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Speaking of finalizing, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> so I went through a few, I, I think as uh, 
listeners can tell this is our Iron Man lineups that's been the most in flux, I feel like, um, for various reasons. Mm. But I went through a few ideas, like, for a while, I was thinking, because the past few campaigns, there's been a moment where I'm like, should I play Bob? Are people going to be playing items? And everyone's like, nah, I'm good. I don't really need items. <laughs> that's happened, like, two campaigns in a row. And then finally, I was like, okay, this might be the one, like... There's, like, special items that you can get and play, and, like, it just seems like this might be the composition. Uh, but then as I was tinkering around with a few different, like, Bob decks, then this idea kept creeping into my head more and more, and then I started building a Daryl deck. And uh, so that's the direction I've gone, is, like, a Daryl Flex Kluver. Um Mainly because the initial idea is just because there's so many, like, treacheries that just stay on the board. It's such a ripe environment mm -hmm. for Daryl's camera, like, that he can put the evidence on there and get some clues and peel the evidence off. Like, for those yeah. reasons, it's one of the most tailor-made campaigns for Daryl, I think. And then also just being able to lower the difficulty of tests, like, that's just generally always useful, um, but in... Uh, edge of the earth you know there's a few tests along the way that are that you have to take to like get those supplies like most of those special supplies you get in ice of death or some kind of ability test you have to take on a location like daryl can help lower the difficulty of those so there's just quite a few reasons and it it feels like you know uh a good campaign for everything that daryl does so most of it is focused around um a variety of different assets to pile up as evidence of course um i really want to play around with the upgraded old key ring um and i'm kind of tickled mm. about the thought of like daryl fumbling around with these old keys in the middle of antarctica <laughs> um, over and over <laughs> um should be fun uh i do want to uh, make use of exploit weakness to get rid of some of those enemies similar to kaimani so just to pitch in a little bit with getting rid of some enemies um when mm -hmm. we need to uh and then you know obviously shed a light is gonna play a role once i get the xp for it so i mean overall pretty standard um another reason i wanted to go survivors because i wanted uh access to alter fate to get rid of some <laughs> yep. of those cards that are sticking around all day alter so, fate is nuts yeah it's nuts card. Yeah. in this campaign yeah definitely definitely gonna play a big role i hope do you have so. do you have grizzled in your deck ian um i thought about it i don't have it right now but i don't know it's what i'm going back and forth on the the problem the problem i'm running into is just like I'm planning for pretty tight like XP compared to some other campaigns, so trying to figure out to what like what to fit in there mm. is tough. But yeah, anytime you're struggling for XP, and then I like see a customizable card I'm looking at, I'm like, oh no, I can't. I know. I yeah. Can't. yeah. <laughs> I feel yeah. like uh, grizzled with a total of five XP, being mm. the always prepared after you draw an encounter card, chosen trait, return it to your hand. Yeah. Um, like if you just put hazard and treachery, mm -hmm. you'll be good. <laughs> yeah. Well, if we but, if we if we play Ice of Death Part Three and get those extra five XP, <laughs> there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we go. <laughs> Fine. Okay, I'm here. What have we learned so far? We've we've learned everything we talked about on the stream as well. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, cool. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing Daryl. Daryl's one where I've played him a few times, but I, I do not think for a second that I've seen, like, his true power. Mm. So, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see what you do with him. Yeah, but of course, then... Between Survivor and Seeker, he actually has, like, a lot of good clue tools, so I'm hoping uh -huh. I can help out a lot. Yeah. Sean, do you think we can get our buddy Brian, who will be at buster con off and on taking pictures to dress up as daryl i mean if we provide the costume i'm sure we can get right to do just about anything yeah, yeah. i mean not that i want to throw another thing onto our plates but i don't know that one seems kind of like a slam dunk get him a snappy fedora mm -hmm. wait what does daryl wear what is yeah, he's he's got like just like your basic pi stuff on right yeah mm -hmm. pretty much 
I mean, if nothing else, we can just call Brian Daryl. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right, Scott, round us out. What you looking at? My idea was to go with Harvey, but we realized that I had already played Harvey in the Dream Eaters campaign. However, my logical conclusion to this, along with you gentlemen, is that playing in the Dream Eaters is half a campaign. And since mm-hmm. we'll be skipping a couple scenarios in this one, we'll be able to justify that this is a now full campaign with Harvey. <laughs> Otherwise, honestly, like, I, I don't know. We're, we're getting to the point where we've played so many Iron Men that I think that any investigators are now open. The only mm-hmm. one I would restrict on that is Min, because she is now one of the Pipers. True. It's storyline. She is She is off in another universe. Like, she, she literally is. Everyone else kind of, like, survived with some trauma, mm-hmm. but she's dead. You know. I'm just now on a mind vacation as to whether it's Iron Men or, or Iron Mans. <laughs> and uh, I don't know which one's right. <laughs> so my deck is super simple. Uh, I'm getting shrewd analysis because I'll be running Dream Diary and I will upgrade it and I really don't care which one I upgrade into because getting a plus two once a turn of the skill card is just that's benefit enough. Uh, fingerprint kit or multi cluing, mag glass, because it adds intellect. I'll upgrade those both. Uh, I'm gonna have one arcane enlightenment, so I can hopefully have a dream diary, a fingerprint kit, and a mag glass all out at the same time. Uh, and also dream enhancing serum, since I'll be drawing a lot of cards because Harvey draws cards. Doctor Milan Christopher, even with the taboo. He adds intellect and, you know, one resource to turn. Still great. Um, moving on to events. I've got Burning the Midnight Oil, uh, just for some economy for myself. And then I have Crack the Case, uh, to kind of support the team with some resources if need be. Deep Knowledge, getting that card draw for whoever needs it to help get through those tech Uh And that's four cards with Harvey, really. Um... Occult Invocation, just because I want some damage output, and I'll be drawing enough cards, I think this is better and more reliable than, than I've got a plan, because I don't doesn't matter what clues I have, it's just, yeah, cards. Practice makes perfect, because uh, I have four skills that I can grab, which is, is fine for me, I think. Uh, and being able to double up on deduction is fantastic. And then Thorough Inquiry is to- draw a total of five cards, and among whoever, it's amazing. Hmm. I love Thorough Inquiry. Yeah. Oh. Thorough Inquiry and Bank Job are two cards that I'm like, oh, God, someone please have them in your opening hand. <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, with Harvey, it's six cards, which is Oh, fantastic. yeah, it is. Yeah. 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 So, uh, I skill. That. I have two Deduction, two Eureka, two Eure- Inquiring Mind, and two Perception. I don't think I need to explain it any more than that, so... <laughs> no I, it's, it's yeah. the juice and the sauce and the meat and the potatoes i don't want to jinx it but i feel like daryl and harvey together should be like smashing through clues i feel like that and i want to make sure that our other two players are ready to kill enemies or tank them and remove them from our area that that will be the goal yes right. <laughs> yeah. yeah i've just been playing or heard stories of people when you know you have different roles set up and one person is cluing and one person is doing the enemy management and when there's no enemies sometimes the clue person Mm -hmm. is expecting the uh the killers to help with the clues and i just don't want you to have to do that oh okay now i understand with which the tone (laughs) that you you gave that yeah yeah, yeah 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 You're saying that in that you will take all of the loads so that we don't have to worry about it. Yes. And can only... Oh, yeah. I mean, I've got four clue cards in my deck, so I think I'll be able to pitch in a little bit. Sean, if you you get two clues this entire campaign, I'll be very happy. (laughs) (laughs) That should be sufficient, yeah. That is my goal. I'll I'll beat that with one pilfer, my friend. (laughs) That's my goal. Like, I don't want you to need to... You're, you're going to hog the clues. I see. I see. We're wow. going to be like those campaigns we've had in the past where the killers are fighting for enemies, and now me and Scott are going to be fighting <laughs> yeah, for <yeah>. clues. 
<laughs> You're locked in the room with us. <laughs> um, looking at my deck real quick, just a side note, I realize I do have a healing card because I'm I'm doing stuff with like uh, placing clues on locations with press pass. So I have bizarre diagnosis in there, which heals oh, okay. damage. So I don't have horror healing, but I do have damage healing in there if we need it. Well, let me introduce you to a little card called Logical Reasoning. Mm -hmm. Well, Logical Reasoning is something I thought I should put in my deck. So maybe yeah, I, I think that would be good for yeah. We could split up the healing a little bit. I mean, I if we don't get those weaknesses, we can just upgrade out of it. So yeah, I, mean, I could try to find room for I don't know Liquid Courage, I guess. But no, no yeah, I don't know. Probably not worth it. Cool, excellent. Well, I'm excited. This is going to yeah. be a fun team, Ian. We'll check in afterward, after the campaign, to determine whether or not you should have gone with Bob. Because this <laughs> is a group. This is a group with a lot of items, so this it may is. have been the window. I don't know. We'll I see. I know the the Bob window may never open again. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Uh, but yeah, overall, I think it's going to be a good team. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Guys, should I go with Bob? <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk I still so love the idea of Harvey. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I suppose. Yeah, number number one. Nick points out that is a really good point. That the <laughs> if we're talking about needing healing, the partners can solve that problem. Mm -hmm. But as That's always, true. there is yep. the well. We can't really rely on it though because some of the partners may or may not be here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to see it. I mean, we could have you yeah. play Daryl Scott and then I do Bob, but we'll we'll talk more after. We'll see. There's still there's still mm -hmm. a little bit of room for maneuvering. What is your your thought strategy plan for Thrice Damned Curiosity or whatever his uh, his weakness is called? Uh, my plan is to not have a huge hand and just be playing cards out as fast as I can. Mm -hmm. Sure. And just so you're you're big draw Harvey, but you're not big hand Harvey. So exactly. Yeah. yeah. I'm not, I'm not looking for like a twelve card hand. I'm looking for like a six card Harvey, and I'm okay. just playing cards out as fast as I can. So it's it's, it's all the super... new variant of poker, the old six card Harvey. Yeah. Like looking at my card cost, six cards out of my thirty cards are over two. That's a very clean curve. Mm -hmm. Love it. All right. Well, that's the team. Yeah. I'm I'm looking forward to this one. Uh, obviously, edges. God, I don't know. There's too many campaigns out there for me to like definitively say that I have a favorite one. But edge is in that <laughs> conversation, so I'm I'm excited for this one in particular. Edge is fun. Yeah, it's a edge fun is one. fun. I guess a couple last notes. Just thinking about like in terms of teching, one of the common themes in like a lot of the encounter cards is. Like, compared to some of the other campaigns, like Innsmouth, there was... Oh, God, I'm already forgetting the treachery. But usually in most campaigns, there's, like, one or two, like, big treacheries that are memorable. Like, you have to tech against them. Um, are you thinking of Zizigy? There's Zizigy, and there's also Deep One Assault. That's the other one. Oh, uh, yes, Deep One Assault, of So course. there's these big ones that... And so, like, as I was going through the encounter cards, like, thinking about what are the ones we have to think about... Like, there's not, like, there are, there are definitely, I mean, treacheries that hurt and this and that, but there's not, like, these big showstopper ones um, across the whole campaign. Um, but there are these themes, like, most of the tests are either will or agility, and the agility tests tend to punish damage, the will tests tend to punish horror. So what you can mm -hmm. expect is if you are playing a low willpower um, investigator then you're probably going to be taking more horror, a good amount of horror, and you probably need to tech for that. So I probably should take my own advice and have some horror healing now that I'm thinking about it. Um, <laughs> uh, on the other hand, if you're playing a low agility investigator, you're probably going to be taking more damage. So you need to think about that in terms of like what soaks you include, what healing you include, or it's just something to keep in mind. Um, and then also there is one treachery and ice and death aporophobia i think is how it's pronounced yeah apirophobia fear of eternity and it, i think i had this when i was a kid um so test <laughs> test will shelter value this one could be rough like if you're at a seven or eight shelter value you take horror for each point you fail by so imagine you auto fail on a shelter eight um or you could place two clues on a location um if you have them or you can add a frost 
which we already said we don't want to add. So we already said you don't want to add a frost, but you also might not be able to like take, you know, a, a big chunk of horror on the chin. So now I, that one does not have uh peril on it, right? It does so, not. So you can discuss so, it, which is nice. So there is that. So like, depending on where we're at in the scenario, it might be worth discussing a defeat and a trauma versus uh, a frost. Yeah. Uh, and important to know, like a lot of treacheries cap that horror. This one does not like, mm-hmm. so you could, you could take that full horror on the chin. Douche move. Probably just didn't have space on the card, honestly, but <laughs> honestly, if you have one clue that satisfies the middle one, so, mm. oh, you can satisfy it with one clue. Yeah. Oh, baby. We got a stew going. Yeah. <laughs> right. Love it. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Good to and, know. And on the note of peril, there's very few peril in this campaign. Like a shockingly mm-hmm. no number of perils. Peril. So, in other campaigns, we had to like have set decisions for these peril treacheries because they could keep coming up. Uh, we won't mm-hmm. really have to do that in this campaign, which is kind of nice for an Iron Man. There's one peril in Fatal Mirage, uh, but it's like take two horror or. Or basically an ancient evils place a doom on the agenda. I, I feel like the decision on that is going to be pretty obvious enough for each person to make without having to do a peril thing. Well, that sounds like a plan. It does. <laughs> and I I actually am kind of excited at how many like little in the moment decisions we could potentially have to make, and mm-hmm. on, on like either skipping scenarios or going after scenarios. Uh, it's going to make for I think a pretty dynamic Iron Man. Mm-hmm. So Agreed. Justin also just wanted me to mention about the drawing of the weaknesses, kind of little ceremony we do. Um, during the convention, uh, I'll have on me pretty much all the time uh, a deck of all the basic weaknesses. And so you can come up to me as your Iron Man team and uh, do the drawing at any point. And the basic rules are that you, as a team, you each draw your weaknesses and then If there's any of them that you want to throw away and redraw, you can set it aside and then you need to shout so the whole room can hear you. Uh, I am a coward and I reject my fate. And uh, then you can redraw, but you must keep the second one. Uh, So, yeah, it's a fun little thing that uh, we've been doing for a couple years and people seem to get a real kick out of it. And the idea behind it is that there are certain weaknesses... Uh, that can really dumpster a deck and we don't want you to necessarily you know set up to play iron man all day get get ready excited and you draw the exact weakness that would just ruin your day and you wouldn't have fun so yeah but there's a little bit of risk to it because you might get a pretty bad one but it's not the worst but do you throw it back yeah Uh, just a little bit of like historical context too Uh, uh back when the game center had like nine to midnight hours back in the heady pre COVID days. We actually had a little bit more time for Iron Man. So the opening mm-hmm. piece of the morning was us going around and giving everyone their weaknesses. Mm-hmm. It was a lot of fun. Um, but uh, unfortunately, since the time crunch has become more of an obstacle, we've we've decided that we'll still do that for anyone on the morning, but we're not going to make a big to-do of it. And anyone who wants to partake, like Scott said, can come at any point uh, ahead of time. And sometimes you just have to be a coward. It's true. I have shared in chat, this doesn't help people on the audio, but I have shared the picture of Ian where uh, you can tell what he's about to say. Oh, yes. starts with an F. (laughs) But does he actually (laughs) shout? I I think he took the weakness. No, he took it. He was just screaming that he pulled the one he didn't want. Yeah, the exact one I did not want. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, and and Scott is using the word must for dramatic effect here. Uh, uh, no one's actually enforcing this. These are just yeah. these are the arbitrary rules, and you you do you. We're not going to call cops. No. I mean, we're we're not doing weakness audits. Yeah. Well, I think I think that just about covers everything we wanted to do to prep for Iron Man. Any final mm-hmm. thoughts before we wrap the sucker up? Pack snacks. <laughs> yes yeah let's talk <laughs> if you haven't listened to our con episode recently yeah. let me give you the highlights bring snacks we have contacted food trucks uh however we can't 
100% verify options will be appealing to everyone at any time and you know the the, the hours that they'll be there so have a plan b well uh, and, and sean i'm sorry i'm going to jump in you might want to yes edit please this do out. yep sorry we'll edit this i've not got any of them to confirm yeah so, yeah exactly so let's so it's, it's tenuous at best yeah um but yeah the food truck is probably not an option but doordash other things it's just got to plan around it mm-hmm yeah, so, well, okay, we don't have to edit, but for, for the editor. The Game Center, most importantly, does not serve food food from a kitchen anymore. They have snacks. Mm-hmm. You can buy them there. Um, but it would be a good idea for you to probably have some kind of meal replacement item that you would enjoy having, that you know you'll enjoy having uh, mm-hmm. on the day uh, available to you. And then, as well, stay Freaking hydrated, y'all. Yeah. It's, it's yes. up the the brain rot of this, um, the, brain, the brain fatigue. Sorry, rot was rot was strong. <laughs> yeah. the, the the brain fatigue of Iron Man sets in f- hard enough anyway. Keep your brain lubricated. Also, big big question in the chat: Can we bring outside food in now? Yes, mm-hmm. yes, mm-hmm. you can. Pack like five lunches. That's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, honestly, like I'm, I'm sure we'll see, we'll probably see at least one Iron Man team roll in with like uh, a cooler of provisions <laughs> and like set up in the corner. Yeah. So anyway, so so those are the big things. Uh, have your XP planned out ahead of time as as much mm-hmm. as you can. Like we said, mental shorthand is is intensely important so that you don't wear yourself out with uh, decision fatigue because you'll be making enough decisions on on the randomness that happens throughout five plus scenarios anyway well boys uh i'm so very excited to see everyone at BusterCon. if i'm remembering our plan and schedule correctly this is going to be our last podcast episode before buster con we're gonna be doing some recording at buster con and and you know for stuff afterward but this is our last real recording i should have said this at the beginning of the episode and in fact editor possibly throw this in (laughs) at the beginning of the episode where it might fit uh we actually have a ton of voicemails i have put out the call and people actually have answered unfortunately at a time when <laughs> our programming is like completely prescribed and doesn't really have much room for voicemails because <laughs> everything that we're doing, everything that we're doing uh, uh, leading up to and after BusterCon is kind of already set. So we really appreciate that everyone has, has called in. We've got uh, uh, people calling in with puzzles that I'm excited to get to. Uh, but unfortunately, we will not be able to get to them uh, at this episode. That'll have to be a post BusterCon thing, very likely. So mm-hmm. hang tight. Hang tight. All right. Excellent. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us for episode 168 of Mythos Busters. We are oh so excited to see you all at BusterCon. Uh, and we'll see you there and after. Bye. 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 Bye.